Well, thank you for making your time available for today. And uh, I'm sure we're all going to enjoy each other's company, I hope. All of you have watched the DVDs, is that correct? So what I wanted to do today, um, rather than cover some specific subject, what I wanted to do was to focus on your questions and answering your questions. And I don't know if many of you came prepared to uh, ask those questions that you have or whether you have many questions. But the reason why I like doing that in the second session after a person's watched a DVD is because usually lots of people have a lot of questions that have come up after watching the DVDs. And also a lot of people have emotions that have come up after watching the DVD. <laughs> you notice that, do you? Yeah. <laughs> and so you might want to discuss some of those emotions and why those things have come up for you uh, after just watching the DVDs. Uh, so I would like to primarily do that today with you, is to give you an opportunity to ask whatever you want. And uh, my... I firstly would like to just say something about my own emotions though for the last few weeks, which is I'm still processing some very deep grief. So I've been crying a lot, so my voice is a bit uh, clogged up today, so we'll see how long I last. Um, and uh, this is something that I've been going through the last eight weeks or so, is primarily dealing with lots of feelings of the lack of self-love. And uh, most of you probably have similar feelings within yourself that you're afraid of dealing with as well. They're very, very deep and they've been actually my most deepest emotions and my most difficult emotions to deal with. So, so uh, that last eight weeks in particular I've been focused on dealing with those. So that's why today I feel a bit clogged up in the chest area and the throat area. Some big issues are coming up for me. I can feel them over the next few days. They're going to come up for me. And so um, I'm feeling a bit clogged here and in the throat in the throat region. Now, when you were watching the DVDs, um, you probably noticed some emotions come up for yourself during them. Now, one of the emotions that probably came up was a feeling of enthusiasm. How many of you noticed that, a feeling of like joy about, of discovery when you were watching them? Yeah. Why do you feel that is? Why do you feel that that, that feeling came up for you? Any truth. ideas? The yeah, the attraction is of the soul to truth. <coughs> and uh, in a, a week or two's time, I think uh, I'm doing another session in Yudlo, uh, up in the Sunshine Coast. And one of the subjects I'll be covering on the Sunday, or, or on the Saturday, I'm not sure which one yet, will be the subject of divine truth and how it resonates with the soul. And all of the aspects of how you can recognise truth as well. And then another uh, subject we'll be covering that we're saying weekend will be forgiveness and uh, what forgiveness is all about. And that will be an interesting topic for many. Um, most people feel they've forgiven when in reality there's huge amounts of emotions inside of us that are yet to be released. And so we'll talk about that a lot on one of those days as well. So you're welcome to come up there as well. All right, so what would you like to ask? Um, when I was watching it, uh, anguish came up for me, and um, it's not having a personal relationship with this thing that is called God. Okay. I don't know what that is other than as an idea. Okay. And my place with that, and the union with that. So the feeling of anguish about not having a relationship with God. <laughs> well, the anguish was there, and I assume that's what that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. H how many of you feel like? God must exist, but who knows who, who or what God is, and who knows whether I've got any relationship with him? How, how, how many of you feel that way? Like, yeah, not just some, not too many. How many of you feel like you do have a relationship with God? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And how many of you feel that you've got a relationship with God, but it seems to be a bit stagnant, in terms of it seems to be a bit blocked? How many feel that? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. So that, that are all types of emotions that, of course, we'll feel. Um, one of the main things to understand about your relationship with God is understanding your own soul and what your soul is. And that's why I always get back to drawing a diagram of the soul. So perhaps I'd like to do that just now. I hope everyone can see the board. Here's our soul. 
Now, our soul is not our spirit body. So here's our spirit body, and here's our material body. Does everyone understand now that, that in, when you pass, you have a spirit body that looks and feels and like, like your own body right now? It, you will recognise yourself the instant you have passed. And if you could look in the mirror, and yes, there are mirrors in the spirit world that you can look into. And if you look into a mirror, you can see your spirit form. Many people, though, in the first sphere of the spirit world never look in a mirror. You know why? Because they look so ugly and it, and it depresses them. And so they never, ever look in a mirror. Do you remember in uh, one of the DVDs, the Udlo DVDs, um, Natalie did a channeling of Howard. Yeah. And remember Howard was uh, in, he said he was in their hills for about 113 years, I think it was, something like that. 121 years, all right. And all through that time, remember I asked him if he looked in the mirror? And he said he never even looked in the mirror, never looked at himself. He <coughs> knew he was going to look ugly if he looked at himself. Why does that spirit body look ugly? Because of the condition of that, the soul, the real you. So understand that this is the real you. So what is the real you? If we could define it, what is the real you? Well, the real you is your passions your desires, your emotions, your feelings. So let's write that down. Passions? You know what I mean by passions? I don't mean the old-fashioned term of, you know, agonies. I mean passions in the sense of, of what you're passionate about, what you want to do something about in your life. Desires. Everyone understands what desires mean? Most people sort of led it to sexual desires or whatever. But I'm talking about all sorts of desires. Even the desire sometimes that you have to harm somebody else. That's a desire too, driven by other emotions. All right? So, so there's all sorts of desires. Just, just give some other examples of desires, what do you mean? Um, a, a desire to have love in your life. That every, your desire for, to be here today is based around a desire for truth. All of these are different desires. So you have, in your life, you can have millions of different desires in different areas. A desire for music, a desire for art, a desire for all of these kind of things. It doesn't mean you'll ever fulfil them necessarily, but they are within you, waiting to be fulfilled. And God actually built inside of you, each of you, he built in this huge variety of different desires that you can choose to fulfil if you wish to fulfil them. Yeah. Um, Emotions. And so emotions I always think of as things like where you feel an emotional response. You feel this emotions pass through you about something that's happening or happened to you. Or perhaps even going to happen to you. That you feel may happen to you. And um, has any of you have ever been onto the site called Centre for Nonviolent Communication on the net? No? Yeah? It's, uh, for all of you, it's www.cnvc.org, I think it is. In there, they have one particular page that I find very, I found very interesting for my own progression, and, and, and my suggestion is to have a look at it. When you begin looking at yourself as a soul, and you begin looking at yourself emotionally, what happens is you, at the start, feel very confused because you don't know what emotions you're actually feeling. Right? And what I found is that on this list, they had a list of, they had a, on the Centre for Nonviolent Communication website, they had a list, that's it, of, of satisfied emotions and what they can be described as one word descriptions for satisfied emotions. And then they had a list of dissatisfied emotions and one word description of all the dissatisfied emotions. And my suggestion is to get up every morning, put the list of dissatisfied emotions in front of you, and ask yourself which ones you feel right now. And that'll start making you become aware of what emotions are actually inside of you really, that you wake up with every morning. <coughs> and uh, so emotions are very much a key part of the soul. Feelings I also classify as part of the soul. They come from they come from the bodies, and by feelings I mean like when somebody touches you, 
that feeling is transmitted through your body and actually into your soul. If the touch is painful, there will be an emotional response in the soul because of the pain that you're experiencing from that touch. If the touch is pleasurable, there will be a different emotional response. You follow me? So feelings are also. And intentions. So if you have an intention, for example, to harm somebody, that is a, is, a, is a part of your soul. Now, a lot of people say, oh, but it's not part of my real self. It's a part of my ego self or my false self or my, you know, and they define the self and separate self. My suggestion is to not do that. My suggestion is to say, all right, inside of me right at this moment, I have this emotion, which is a part of me right at this moment. It doesn't define who I am. It's just a part of me right now, and I need to feel it. Now, once I start understanding that this is the soul, that's when I start understanding, too, that I can connect with God's soul only via my soul. Does that make sense to you? So, I can't connect to God by doing anything with this spirit body. So, you know, all the metaphysical things that you see happening sometimes, you know, where people do energy work on their spirit body, you know, they do body work with their physical body. They do all of these kind of things with, all, with their bodies, trying to get their bodies in tune and feeling good and all of those kind of things. All of those things, although they have a positive effect on you temporarily, they are not going to connect this with God. All right? Now, they may help alleviate some of the damage in this, which may actually lead you in some point to connect to God. But in the end, understanding what the soul is, is the most important thing to understand. Now, the soul is not something you can touch physically, and it's not even something in the spirit world that you can touch in spirit form either. And in fact, many spirits who are on the natural love path believe their soul is their spirit body. So that's why they say they have body, mind and spirit. And in fact, the mind even is the mind of this spirit body. It's like a brain, if you like, of the spirit body. So you've got your brain here, right, in your material body, which processes information and also physiologically keeps your body functioning. And then you've got a mind in your spirit body, which actually has and retains many of your memories and so forth. But actually, it's the soul that is the real you. And these are just appendages of you. They're like your arm or your leg. Your whole body is just an appendage of you, in fact. Right. If you can understand that your whole body is an appendage of you, then the thing to develop is the real you. And there's only one way to develop the real you, and that is in love. Love is the, is the, is the operating force of the universe. Right. So. I can't just say that I love, and I can't just think that I love. I've actually got to get to a stage, if I'm going to develop my soul, of actually feeling love in every one of these places, in my passions, my desires, my intentions, and all those kind of Feeling the love that's there. And I need to be truthful with myself. Do I really feel love there? Or am I just manufacturing it all up here, making out that in fact that's the way it is, but in reality it's not the way it is? I need to become truthful with myself. So how many of you have been angry this week, in the last week? <laughs> My majority of us, right? Okay. Now, what does anger do? Anger covers something deeper. Right. Fear or all sorts of different emotions anger covers, right? Now, rather than going to all those emotions. So when I was angry, I was denying myself. That follow? I was choosing, actually, to deny an emotion that was deeper, to deny the emotional experience of that deeper emotion in my soul, the moment I was angry. So right at that moment, I chose to, ch I chose to actually deny that I'm this, that I'm the soul. I chose to deny that I'm that. And I actually then came into another part of me, which is not the real me. And I lived there for that time that I was angry. And if I was angry for the whole week, that's where I've been the whole week. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can you give an example, please? 
All right. Um, when, I was, when you were watching the DVDs, and when I said, when I made the comment that I'm Jesus, how did you feel inside of yourself? Be honest. <laughs> Confused. <laughs> doubtful. Yeah, let's look at the doubtful one, because that's, that's pretty a pretty common one. <laughs> Understandably so. Let's go into the doubt. What was the doubt about? Be honest. Is he truthful? What's his motives? Anything else? Is, you know, is there a catch? Or is there a catch? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> down the is, he, is he going to try and extract money from me down the track? Down the track. I, I didn't think. I honestly didn't think that, but I, I guess some people would. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <sort of. laughs> no one else believes you. It doesn't feel very good when no one else believes you. <laughs> All right, so, so now that doubt, that doubt is covering other emotions, isn't it? So what are the emotions that the doubt is covering? What, what's the emotion? Yeah, fear. fear of what? Uh, you've been let down. Yeah, fear of being let down. How many times have you been let down through a spiritual path in your life? How many times? Mm. Most people? Yeah. Or have all of you been let down yeah. at some stage in your oh, spiritual yeah. development? Yeah, Where you've taken a certain path, it gets to a certain point and then you think, what? Where, why did I come down this road? And you seem to shoot off on this road, dot off on that road and so forth and before you know it, like you, you're at a place of confusion again. All right? And what's this guy going to do? Is he going to do exactly the same with you? All right? So that, that's one big issue, isn't it? Of an, an emotion with him. What other, what other emotions? Okay, yeah. So, so what's this? I, I feel he might be Jesus. What's this going to do to all my relationships? Like everyone's going to think I'm nuts. Yeah. Everyone's going to think I'm crazy now. Like he's crazy now. I'm crazy. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. We'll be lost. Yeah. 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 No, that's a big. That's a big issue for many people. So, so really the fears, if you can see it, the fears are actually covering over the deeper emotion. In that particular case, what's the deeper emotion? A fear of rejection. So in other words, I don't want to feel rejection. Right? That's, that's why I don't want to say, oh, he might be Jesus. So I talk about everything else and then I say, do I want, him, do I want to give him the... You'd load DVD copy. No, no, because he says he's Jesus in that. So, so what I'll do is I'll, so I'll give him the law of attraction copy because he doesn't say he's Jesus in a whole lot of that, right? Or, or whatever. So, so a lot of times we make decisions and what we don't realise is we're actually making these decisions based upon our emotional injury that we could have an opportunity to trigger at that moment and release, but we choose not to. That make sense? And so what's happening is that every single one of these circumstances comes along and triggers something inside of our soul. And then we make a choice. What's the choice in many cases? The choice is to avoid the emotion that's being triggered. All right? Rather than go, going into it and allowing the emotion to be triggered. Right? Now, of course, I've faced exactly the same issues that you've faced with that, right? So, like, one, once I remembered again who I was, like, once I went through all of those emotional processes and, and all these memories came back and all of those kind of things happened, once I got to that point, my first major problem was, uh-oh, I've now got to tell somebody else that I am. <laughs> right? And what's that going to bring inside of me? Like, rejection, right? Nobody's going to believe me. They'll all doubt. They won't listen to anything I've got to say after that. And all of those kind of things happened, right? And so I had to work through all of those things emotionally, just like you, you have to work through those things emotionally. When I say have to, I mean if you want to be at one with God, these are emotions that are in you that need to be released. Right? Every one of you, if you want to be at one with God, every one of you will need to be born again. To be born again, it means that you're going to have to feel every emotion, every moment you feel it. And that's a big challenge, isn't it? What if the emotion is the emotion of rejection or abandonment? How you, 
what about if the emotion is that you have no friends? You realize, you just come to this realization that there is not a single person in your life who really loves you enough to let you discover a truth and, and be fine with that. What if that's the emotion? Are you going to deal with that and feel that emotion? Well, we may say we're never alone, but the truth is, right, that we often feel like we are, don't we? How many of you feel like you were alone last week? Like, that you, and you feel lonely in your life? Like quite a lot, right? Now, I can sit down here and tell you that you're not alone, but does that do anything? No. Why doesn't it do anything? Because you don't believe it in your heart. And why don't you believe it in your heart? Because there's this other emotion inside your heart right at this moment saying, I am alone. All my life I've been alone. That's how I've been treated all my life. And that emotion has to come out of you. And the only way it can come out is by experiencing it, feeling it. Yeah. And that's why I said in the first century, you need to become like a little child to enter the kingdom of God. What does a little child do with their emotion? Do they sit there and say, oh, I've observed my emotion? And <laughs> do they say that? What do they do? They just express it. Right? So if I can sit down and I say, I'm observing my emotion, yes, my, I'm very angry actually now that I observe it. <laughs> and I'm not feeling it and expressing it. What am I doing? I'm locking down the soul. I'm locking down my real self. And if I lock down my real self, am I loving myself in that instant? Can you see that if you love yourself completely, you will be dedicated completely to feeling every emotion inside of you at every moment, if you love yourself completely. Wouldn't you be walking around with a mess the rest of your life? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, you, you won't walk around for a mess the rest of your life, but you'll certainly walk around for a mess for a while. And <laughs> all right. <laughs> so the question then is, why am I walking around for a mess for eight years if I'm feeling my emotions? Would that be right? Okay. So, and this is part. I suppose this is a very, it's a very important question, because. Most of you have tried emotional work probably at some stage in your, in your own life and then it's got to these really deep dark emotions, you've felt like you've felt them and then lo and behold nothing is really changing and you feel like you're feeling them over and over again and over again and over again and what's really going on, what's happening? What is going on do you think? Well, yeah, there's, there's actually two types of emotions that we have within us. One's, one we could call causal, and the other type of emotions are effect type emotions. And of course one affects the other, so, so naturally causal emotions affect uh, and create other emotions. And then sometimes as we grow, those get fed back into the system and, and we have this layered effect of emotions. But let's look at effects versus causes. Let's look at it from a purely material point of view first. From a material point of view, does changing the law so that instead of driving at 80 kilometres an hour, now you've got to drive at 70, does that stop all the people from speeding? No. Why not? Because they're stuck at 80 k Right? And there's something going on inside of them emotionally, isn't there? Yeah. There must be. It doesn't apply to me. It doesn't apply to me. Exactly. I, I, I'm, I have a feeling of rebellion inside of me. I don't like this law, so I'm not, gonna, <laughs> I'm not going to live by it, right? Now, does changing anything externally, pointing at an effect, change anything? It doesn't. And the same applies to your emotion. So let's say... Um, an example, let's say I'm a, I'm a woman living in an abusive relationship and every single day I get beaten by my partner. Now, that woman would cry every day probably, would she not? But is she releasing the causal emotion? What is she actually doing? Releasing the effect. She's releasing the effect. She gets hurt, she feels her hurt, goes and cries about the hurt. 
but she doesn't actually go deeper and find out, well, why did this thing happen to me? What, what inside of me attracted this event to cause me to feel this way? And what's the underlying cause? And so what often happens is that we get stuck in this area here with our emotions. We get stuck in dealing with effects. And we never get to the actual thing that created the emotion. Right? So uh, to give you an example, um, I, I met my soulmate, and uh, this was like uh, four months, five months ago. We had a brief uh, relationship for a couple of months, and then my soulmate feels like we can't have a relationship anymore. And that just brought up huge amounts of rejection emotions for me. Right? So I begin feeling these rejection emotions. But are they about my soulmate rejecting me? No. But I, I have in the past cried for nearly seven years about the breakup of a relationship. So why is that? You're a slow learner. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to Like that, yeah. <laughs> and I'd have to agree with that. <laughs> I feel like I am. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that is true. I was a slow learner. So, so what didn't I learn? I was crying about the effect. Yeah, the effect. So, what I was wanting is I want the relationship back. I want the relationship back. I want the relationship back. And I wasn't looking at the deeper issues. Now, as it's worked out, now that I've gone into the deeper issues of the breakup of this relationship with my soulmate, right, and I wouldn't say it was broken up, I'd just say that we're just apart for the moment, we've decided to be apart. Once, once, I, once I started connecting with all the emotions about that, they all related to first century events in my life, to do with how my parents treated me all the way through my life. <coughs> and. And so all of my emotions were all related to actually my parents from the first century and, and what actually happened with all of these different events. And what I've had to do is now process those events. Right. Can I give you an example of one or two? Yeah. Right. And one of the biggest emotions inside of myself is a lack of love of myself. That's how I can cry for seven years about not being in a relationship. Right because the extent of my lack of love for myself was so big. And once, uh, and I needed my soulmate to trigger it, so, so obviously we met, that got triggered, and now the extent of the, my lack of self-love starts getting released. In the previous relationships, all I did is concentrated on the effects. I never actually started looking at the self-love issue, because the self-love issue was so painful for me that I didn't want to go there. Right? So I'd go anywhere else, I'd, you know, I'd say, oh, what's wrong with me? You know, what, why don't you like me? What, you know, what can I change? And all those kind of things. But inside of myself, there was just this huge lack of self-love which created the event of being rejected. Right? And I wasn't willing to feel that. Now, once I started allowing myself to feel it over the last few weeks in particular, it's been pretty intense, where I've been crying like four or five hours every day, pretty, pretty solid every day. For, for, day, for weeks on end. Well, it's been nearly eight weeks now I've been doing that. So, and, but it's all been about stuff that's happened to me through my life before I even met my soulmate. And in particular, what, what it was related to is two things in pri primarily. One is my, my relationship with women was related to how I feel about myself as a male and how I feel about women. Right? So that, that's the, the two things that are linked. And both of those things were linked to first century treatment. Firstly, my father in the first century, um, Joseph, he, he had the attitude that he was cursed to have me as his son. And that was quite an intense emotion for me to go through emotionally and feel that, just feeling that, and some of you probably feel that with your own families right now even, that your mum or your dad feels that they're cursed to have had you. And that's a very strong impression upon a, a young child in terms of emotionally impression uh, that creates a lot of lack of self-love. Because the, the child then starts taking on that, that their own father or their own mother feels that they're cursed or even have you, so you should never have been born. How many of you have felt the emotion? 
I should never have been born. Yeah, quite like that. And it's terrible emotion to feel. And so we avoid it. And the way we avoid it is we look for relationships where people will treat us nicely so that we can avoid that emotion. So we feel that there's some validation through the experience of the relationship. The problem with that is that eventually, because of this emotion being in our soul, we attract a relationship where they'll reject us again and we'll feel like we've never been born, should never have been born again until we release the cause, the actual cause that's within us. And so what I've been concentrating on the last few weeks is releasing the cause of that, the, the actual emotion itself. And yeah, it been to some really dark places with that emotion. So that's one example. On the other side, my mother in the first century used to, um, she was very confused by me and didn't understand me at all. And, um, and the reason why is that I was totally different to my five brothers. I had five brothers and I was totally different to my five brothers. And, uh, and so she couldn't understand, or, and also to most of the males who were around her. So she couldn't understand me at all. And then as I grew up, she understood me less and less. And, to, and when I started to talk about God's essence or God's substance of divine love entering my soul and transforming my soul, she became very uh, confused and fearful about what I would do with that. And she thought that I'd become some kind of religious zealot who was willing to die um, for, for his faith. And she became very, very frightened. And so, so what she, was, she used to do was follow me around saying to everyone that I was crazy. So I had my mother saying I was crazy and my father feeling cursed to have ever, to have ever had me. And they were the primary emotions coming from my parents, along with many others, of course. And so I've had to work my way through those emotions and let myself feel what it feels like to be rejected and feel like you're crazy. Yeah. How many of you feel I'm crazy, honestly? It's all right. I'm okay with it. <laughs> Is there a way that you find um, you're able to access that is it, is it prayer or is it just sitting quietly with yourself or is it just feeling it whenever it comes up? Yeah, the way now is different than I used to do right at the start. And the reason why is now I can connect very rapidly to all emotion. Whereas at the beginning I didn't have a clue about what any of the emotions were with inside of me. So at the beginning it was very, very difficult to connect to the emotion. And what I needed to do at the beginning was I used a lot of tools to, to trigger me. So, for instance, if I was afraid of people, which I was for a lot of my life this time, uh, afraid of groups of people, what I would do is I would, I would spend a whole day in a shopping centre where there's like thousands and thousands of people and, and just sit there and absorb all the energy and try to feel why I was so afraid there, for example. So I would do things like that all the time to try and trigger the actual emotion. So if I notice the emotion inside of me, I would then go and do what I was afraid of doing to trigger that emotion. And I had to do that all the time. Uh, it was the only way I could access emotion at the beginning. Now it's totally different. Now what I can do is I can just sit, sit with myself quietly and I pray and long to God to help me deal with this emotion. And I just sit there and just all I do is think, just let myself free think, if you like, with, or I would call it free feeling and just free feel what pops into my head at the moment. And in, within a few seconds usually, there's a, the feelings pop there and, and then straight away allow the connection with the emotion. But you go to a, you've got to allow the grieving emotion. So for most people, like you look at a child and the way a child pro, pro, uh, looks at emotion. How do, how do they process their emotion? An event happens, they're in their emotion. Like there's, no, there's no delay, is there? The event happens and they're in. Uh, there's very little delay. And if there isn't any delay, it's usually because their mother or father has suppressed their expression of emotion, right? Now, in the end, that's where you can do that. You can instantly go into the emotion as soon as, as, soon as the event occurs and fully experience the emotion. Now, the reason why we don't is because we've got all of these blockage layers over the top of the, that process. And so what I've found myself is that the only thing that can access initially when you're in a state where you're not feeling all of your emotions, then there are blockages that need to be released. So if you can imagine your soul, so, so I'll just 
draw the soul in. So here's your soul, and it has the emotion right, right deep down in the emotion in the emotion of empty, like it just feels totally empty. Now, what we do is we surround ourselves with protections around that emotion, right? And they become our blockages, if you like, to feeling that emotion. So the first thing that we need to do is unravel the blocks. And that becomes the most difficult process that you will experience in your emotional processing work. Unraveling the blockages to actually experiencing the emotion. When it comes to experiencing the emotion, you will probably, in the end, quite enjoy it and feel quite good afterwards once you've experienced the emotion. But actually unraveling it to get to the emotion or unraveling all the blockages is the hardest thing. And I've found that very, very difficult at times, where I've spent months unravelling blockages to feeling the emotion. My soulmate emotions of loss of my soulmate, I've just had huge... And the reason why I stayed in this relationship and cried about it for seven years was because of the huge blockages I had to feeling the pain of the soulmate separation emotions. Yeah. So, so the key is to be willing to feel everything. And, uh, but you don't get there instantly it's not you know you don't jump from being unwilling to feel everything to being willing to feel everything there's all these blockages that need to be pulled out of you along the way so if you could think of all the blockages as emotional error inside of you error i mean beliefs that you have that you believe to be true for example how many of you believe that your mum and dad did a good job raising you That's going to be a major block for you processing emotion. <laughs> right? The reason why is because, because that belief says, that belief is really saying emotionally, I'm not allowed to criticise my mum and dad for anything they did now. Now that also then, if we take that one step further, means that if I have an emotion, a feeling inside of me that says, that's of anger with my mum and dad for something that they did, I can't release it because it's unfair. So straight away that one belief is going to shut down a whole group of childhood emotions. Right. That makes sense for you? Yeah. And so this is where, so what's the block? The block is the guilt associated with feeling that mum and dad did something wrong when all of your life they're trying to tell you they did the best they could. And you now believe they did the best they could. And you know what? You may be right. And you probably are right. But this is what we often do with emotions. What we do is we say, here's our end point. Here's where we are right now. Here's all the emotional baggage in between. All right? In between. And what we do is we intellectually jump from there to there. And then we say, you beauty, I've dealt with everything. <laughs> and nothing in our life changes very much because this emotional baggage is what's in the soul causing all the attractions, and it's the attractions that cause your life. All right? So unless you're willing to experience this baggage, remember, when you're a child, what happens? You have the emotional event occurs, and you experience it straight away. So someone comes up and punches you in the arm, what do you do? Sit down and have a big cry. And a lot of times, what do we hear parents saying? Oh, he's not really crying about the hurt, because it didn't hurt him very much. Mm. Yeah, here it hurt him. <laughs> it hurt him enough for him to cry for half an hour. That's where, that's where it hurt him. Not, not there, in the punch in the arm, but in his heart, how can some, the feeling of, how can somebody come up and punch me? How can, you know, what, what does that mean inside of myself? What does it mean when somebody wants to hurt me like that? Why do they want to hurt me like that? There's all these emotions in there, right? And when we say to ourselves, stop crying, that didn't hurt, what are we really saying? We're really saying, you can experience this hurt, the physical one, you know, the one that's broken your arm or whatever, but you can't experience this hurt, the emotional one. That, and it's the emotional one that defines the rest of their life. Right? So, what we all need to come to realise is, all these emotions that were denied through our childhood, and all of us have emotions denied during our childhood, all of those emotions are what is right now defining our life. Now, each one of those emotions are snap freezes in time. So, so let's say three years old, some little child in the kindergarten came up and punched me in the arm and kicked me and 
and I just laid down on the floor crying and then the, then the kindergarten teacher came up and said, what are you crying about? You don't need to cry, it wouldn't hurt that much. And all of that emotion was shut down. Now that emotion now is inside of you frozen. You can think of it like being in a freezer, waiting for you to thaw it out, waiting for you to experience it. Because you didn't experience it fully when it happened. That's the only reason why we have to do this because we didn't experience it fully when it happened. That make sense? So, if you want to intellectually jump from one to the other, and this is something that almost all spiritual methodologies do, is they jump from the point where I am now, so this point is, I am here right now, right? This point is where I know I should be, right? <laughs> and so what we do is we then jump from that one point to the other point. We learn all of these things, all these spiritual techniques and all of these things, meditation and other techniques. And so what we do is we use that tool to jump from one location to the other location and skip over and deny and actually don't experience all of the baggage that gets us there real. So this is what's real. This is just a fake thing. And most of us in our own spiritual progression has, have done the fake thing. And we need to be honest about that. And we need to get back to doing the real thing, which is the emotional experience. That's the real thing. So what about um, the people who have reached those points? So they, they're still, even though they may be in a state of enlightenment, say, yep. do they still have um, a shitload of emotions hiding underneath? Many times, yes. Um, do you remember the channeling? If you watch the DVDs, you remember Lucinda's channeling. Mm -hmm. Lucinda was a six sphere spirit. Now, six sphere spirit has been perfected in natural love. So, in other words, they are living now in what they feel is a state of bliss, right? Right at that moment. And they feel they have no emotional baggage left. And then she said, and I don't know if you remember the comment, that she needed to become real. And she went back to the third sphere and learned a heap of things about herself that she wasn't being real about. And this is exactly the process we need to do too. And many of the people who are on earth who are in a state of enlightenment are actually in a state of detunement. They're not in a state of enlightenment. And in fact, if they were in a state of true enlightenment, they would never even say they are enlightened. Because enlighten, enlightenment, we were talking about this myself and, and Grant this morning, about what enlightenment is. And enlightenment, everybody starts thinking of enlightenment as an end point. Like, that, like that's when, when you reach enlightenment, that's, that's it. But the way God created the universe is, <clears throat> and uh, who, who hates Bible quotes? Be honest. Okay, well you're going to get triggered a bit today too. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 in the Bible says, God has put time indefinite into their hearts so that they may never find out what the true God has done. In other words, God inbuilt inside of you, and this is a truth of the universe, that God has built infinite infinity inside of you. He's built the desire for everlasting life inside of you. Why do you think you put on potions and take pills and all those things? Isn't it so that you can live longer and happier, isn't it? In just about all cases. You know, how many of you look in the mirror each day and notice the wrinkle and say, oh, you know, it doesn't feel good having the wrinkle, does it? Why doesn't it feel good? Because it doesn't feel right, does it? It doesn't feel right. It's not what you feel inside. It's not a reflection of that. It doesn't seem. And so it doesn't feel right. And that is the truth. The truth is that God has made you to be an everlasting being. Even in your physical form, it's possible. God has made you to do that. And inside of your soul, there's this feeling that that's true. And you don't know how that's true, and you don't know how you can achieve that, perhaps. But there's a feeling inside. And that feeling inside is what drives you for truth and drives you to feel like you're younger than you really are, or all of those kind of things, right? That's, that's that truth. And this is the case with a lot of our feelings, is a lot of our feelings are driven by truths that we don't understand as truths yet, and we don't understand how they're achievable. Right? So when we do this jumping, and, I, and there was part of the question that I just, that's just 
flicked my mind there too, because it was really important. But anyway, when we do this jumping intellectually from one place to another, what happens is we're skipping over all this emotional baggage, and it's all the emotional baggage that is going to make the experience real. And if you decide you want to become an enlightened being, then in the end, true enlightenment is understanding that you are a perpetual student. Right? Because you think about it, if God's infinite, and God's built everlasting life into your heart, a desire for everlasting life inside of you, then obviously you're going to be perpetually learning, aren't you? Okay. Now, what happens with uh, on the development of, this, of the six fierce spirits, if you like, the natural love, is they're developing themselves intellectually, skipping over emotional development, developing themselves intellectually and morally, and many times doing some emotional work as a byproduct, but skipping over many things within themselves, many truths within themselves. And they get to the sixth fear, but they can't progress any further because their heart isn't in it. Right? There's all this false self beliefs that have covered over the true feelings inside the heart. So right now, you have within you all of these beliefs about yourself that you think you are, but you're not. And then you have all these beliefs that you've got no idea about yourself that you are. And you, many of you choose to present the false self to everyone else. So this is where relationships become very difficult because I'm choosing to present a false image of myself to the, my partner, but it's not how I'm really feeling. Right? It doesn't work either. And it doesn't work in the long run, no. That's why we eventually finish up breaking up or having a terrible relationship. Yeah, because it just doesn't work. The only thing that is going to work is truth. Truth is what actually establishes a love bond. And that's the only thing that's going to work. That, what is truth? <coughs> truth is total emotional nakedness. So how many of you don't want to be emotionally naked? <laughs> A lot of you. More than what put up their hands. <laughs> yeah. and, the reason, and the reason why? Why don't you want to be totally emotionally naked? <laughs> because of, yeah, issues of vulnerability. Uh, that makes me vulnerable. Actually, do you know, it's actually totally the opposite. To being totally emotional and naked makes you more powerful. But you just believe, it's a false belief, that it makes you more vulnerable. How many people feel that if you tell the truth, people will hurt you with it? Yeah, I mean, it's a common belief, right? Yeah. Why do people lie? Because of that, because of that <coughs> false belief. That false belief that if I tell the truth, I'm going to get pain. So how many times does that actually happen in life? All the time, doesn't it? Right from a young age. How many times have you with your own children said, tell me the truth, tell me the truth, they tell you the truth and you give them a belt? <laughs> How many times have you done that? So what has that taught them? <laughs> truth, pain. Truth, pain. Truth, pain. <laughs> right? And then, and then so, what, so what happens then? Of course they're not going to tell you the truth the next time, are they? They're going to do everything but tell you the truth. And then you say to them, you know, I'm really disappointed in you. You never told me the truth. <laughs> of course I never told you the truth, right? And, and this is what you learnt growing up, is to not tell the truth, not live in truth, not be exactly how you feel inside. So let's say you're in a partnership and there's something that you find very unattractive about your partner. <laughs> so you don't tell him, eh? You don't tell him. Why not? Because, you know, who knows might might happen. They might, you know... <coughs> They might get into a big angry fit and leave, and who knows, you know, I don't know what might happen. But while you're holding that truth within you and not expressing that truth, that truth is actually now defining the relationship, right? It's actually changing everything. So if, talking about the soul is so important. Understanding the soul is the emotions and feelings, the truth of those inside of yourself. Now understand that all of you have emotions inside of yourself that you can express as your truth, but they are not God's truth. Right? So do you think I would worry about a partner who has a certain thing that they do? You know, like, I don't know, maybe he lifts the toilet every time, you know, and he never puts it back down. Yeah. Right? Just something simple like that. <laughs> yeah. It's a common woman one, though. 
<laughs> and if guys say, well, why doesn't she put it down, uh, lift it up for me? <laughs> and, and, and maybe something like that is driving you nuts. Why is it driving you nuts? Now, you can say the truth to your partner, that's driving me nuts. And your partner would be wise to say back, why is that driving you nuts? <laughs> what emotion, <laughs> what, what do you feel when I do that? And you'll get down to some pretty deep emotions about that. It will be about being invalid as a woman, not being, you know, lots of different stuff will come up if you allow yourself to go further into that place. Just that one tiny little event. And why is it creating this anger in you? Because you're denying a deeper emotion and the deeper emotion are terrible, sometimes terrible, powerful, really scary emotions that you just don't want to feel. And so instead, you get angry with the person who did that thing that triggered you. You shoot the messenger. Yeah. So, when it comes to experiencing your emotions, let yourself experience everything and let yourself see that every time you try to cover over it, you are going to respond in anger or resentment or some other kind of capping emotion. So if you find yourself being an angry person or you're finding yourself getting addicted to different things, and, I'm, and I mean even addicted to spiritual things, like addicted to you know, having to meditate every day so that I can cope with my life, for example. If you're addicted to that, then you need to look very seriously at what's the underlying emotion that's being covered over because that's what needs to be experienced. When you experience that, you won't need to meditate to get away from it anymore because it won't be inside of you anymore. Right? And that's what is meant, and again, quotes for Bible. <laughs> and one of the reason why I find the Bible so fascinating is for me, in my first century existence, it was the key to me discovering divine love. And the reason why it was the key for me discovering divine love is because there were passages in the Bible, particularly in Jeremiah and, and Ezekiel, that are very close to my heart. And those passages relate to the transformation of the heart. And in fact, in one verse it says that um, the heart would be transformed from a heart of stone into a heart of flesh. And I started understanding that as meaning that my emotions and my passions, my desires, my feelings, everything to do with my emotions, was related to or shut down, was related to either being shut down or being openly expressed. And I started realizing that if your emotional state is allowed to be fully expressed, in the end you won't hold on to anything. And it's only the holding on to the emotion that creates the law of attraction which creates the negative events in your life. Do you, do you understand that? Yeah. The emotion you're holding on to creates the negative events because of the detractions, which then creates the painful experiences in your life. So if I experience the emotion fully, then all of these other effects, so this is where it gets down to cause and effect, all of these other effects will automatically disappear. I'll give you an example. On the way back on the plane, uh, I, I was overseas recently, and on the way back, we travelled uh, from Singapore, sorry, from London to Singapore to Western Australia to Perth. And um, I'm a vegan, so so you know I'm pretty fussy with what I eat nowadays. When I say fussy, I just can't eat certain foods, uh, not not because of any other reason than I just throw them up, uh, because it just doesn't feel right for my soul to eat them. And what happens is that uh, I usually tell you know the airlines what meals I want and so forth, which I did in this trip. Anyway, I was sitting down and everyone's getting fed and the only person in the whole plane that doesn't get a meal is me. <laughs> and my soulmate's sitting next to me and she's, she's starting to get stressed. She, she wants to give me some of her food. I say, no, no, I'm not going to have any of your food. I need to feel what emotion created this. There's an emotion that created this. And then she started saying to me that, she feels guilty about me not having any food. I said, that's, that's your emotion. You need to feel that, right? And then she started getting a bit upset with me and angry with me, feeling that I um, was being a martyr because I should, <laughs> she couldn't eat all of her milk. And I'm saying, no, I'm not being a martyr. <laughs> I'm just trying to feel my own emotions. So what I did was I put on my headphones and just turned off all everything so it was a bit quieter and let the emotions come up of... And the emotion that came up for me 
was that nobody cares for me. Right? And I cried on the plane. About 20 minutes later, this man comes up, one of the, one of the attendants comes up and he says, uh, you didn't get a meal. No, I didn't. She, she wanted to tell him that I didn't get a meal. And I said, no, no, I don't want that to occur either. Because the law of attraction is, they will give me a meal when I deal with this emotion. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So, so what I did was focus on dealing with the emotion and acknowledge the emotion and, and had a bit of a cry about the feeling of not being cared for. And all of a sudden, this, these actually two attendants, a lady and a man, came up and said, oh, you never got a meal. And I said, oh, no. And they said, oh, what do you like? And I said, oh, well, I'm vegan. And, you know, so, so anything, vegetable, soup, whatever. And, um, yeah, and, and I said exactly what I like, a big salad and some soup. <laughs> and lo and behold, about five minutes later, they brought back from first class <laughs> <laughs> this beautiful bowl of uh, soup that was, that was all vegetable soup and, and this big, big salad. And, and my girl looked at me like, you know, <laughs> jealous, right? And, uh, but, but what, and what I said to her, uh, and we talked about it, and I just said, well, yeah, can you see what happened there? You know, it was, what it was was that if I didn't deal with that emotion, I would have been totally overlooked, and I would have had to put my hand up and say, look, I never got a meal, and have the argument with them or whatever, right? But I didn't have to do any of that, just dealing with the emotion. You follow me? Once I dealt with the emotion, the law of attraction changed. And I got what I really wanted. And not only did I get what I really... I got the meal exactly what I really wanted, which is very rare on an airline, isn't it, to get that. So that just changed completely. Can you describe in as much detail as you can exactly what was happening with the headphones on and processing that? Sure, sure. What I did was I firstly allowed myself... To to just feel what it was like to be totally overlooked, right? And then I went into that emotion of just feeling like, uh, like nobody actually cares for me and I keep giving, keep giving, keep giving, but nobody wants to care, care for me. And I went into that emotion and just allowed myself to feel that. And when I went into the feeling of that, and that's why I cried, I, I could feel all the a lot of the times in my life where nobody had cared for me and I hadn't felt the emotion then. I've just skipped over it and for, or, or you know, put my hand up, say, care for me, care for me, and get them to do it, where I hadn't really felt the emotion itself. And so I went into the emotion, and the emotion sort of... With me, the emotion comes up and overwhelms me, so, so that's why I started crying. And then, and then once, once I just let myself do that, um, and I didn't... On a plane, it's pretty hard to do it as much as what your soul needs, so I could have probably cried two or three hours, but but I'd cried enough for the law of attraction to change. Uh, I don't know how you feel about emotion, but I feel sometimes like the emotion firstly rising as heat, and then it just sort of overwhelms, yeah. You're saying you've got sort of like your emotions, passions and desires, which make your soul up, and then you say you've got your mind, which is part of the spiritual body, and it's not what your soul is. Mm -hmm. But in, in that sort of situation where you, you, you've been... Yep. Impacting on everything. Yep. Then you need to, like, you need to use your mind mm -hmm. to create the space totally. to feel your emotions. Yeah, and see, so don't. Otherwise, you'll just keep skipping over it. Yeah, don't time. confuse what I'm saying with criticism, because what I'm saying is that in your pristine state, you do not need your mind at all. But we have our mind. Our mind has, instead of being a tool of our soul, our mind has become the domineering factor over our soul. And the reason why it did that was because when we were a child, we were abused. And no matter how you term it, it is in the end. Emotional, physical, whatever, sexual, or what, mental, whatever the abuse is, it's still abuse. And that abuse suppresses the soul. And so, yes, we've learnt to live in a mind-dominant life. And, and you look at the world today. The world today is a mind-dominant society. Right? So we actually, we've been taught through this multi-generational to live even in a mind-dominant society as well. Now, I'm not criticising that that happened. No. What I'm saying is we need to get back from that happening back to our pristine state. But we also have to use our mind to do that as well, don't we, in a way? We have to kind of 
I've, I, I feel now, no. Now it's very rare for me to have to use my mind now. Um, so, but yes, when you begin, certainly. <laughs> because, because you're so mind dominant that you need to now deconstruct all of the... Remember I talked about all the blocks. You need to deconstruct all those blocks. And many of those blocks are beliefs coming from the soul but influencing the mind. So, so yes, you do need to use your mind to make decisions to, to help you emotionally. But, but swap it around. Instead of being mind dominant, become emotion dominant and use your mind as a tool to access the emotion. Yeah? So at the moment, for many of you, your mind is the active controller of you. So in other words, your mind is here dominating everything that's going on in your life. Right? What I'm suggesting is you're going to need to turn that on its end and you're going to have to have the emotions dominating everything in your life and your mind helping these emotions to be exposed and lived and experienced. That's what's going to need to occur. Because in my experience of like obviously the spiritual new age stuff, it's the opposite. It's like thought creates reality. You know, positive thinking, all that stuff. So you can sit here and think of someone you love and you feel love. You can think of someone you hate and you feel hate. So the thoughts create the emotion. Mm. So that goes against everything that they've kind of created. Exactly. So that's really, you know. You, obviously you can have certain thoughts that create emotions but only if those emotions already exist within you. So, so for example, if you have a thought of some, a person and because of a previous interaction or that person reminds you of, of a previous interaction, there might be a feeling of hatred associated with that person where you feel like you don't like them. Now that, that isn't your mind creating that. There's an emotion inside of yourself that's, that because of you thinking about that person triggered this emotion and that emotion then triggers an additional thought, I hate them. So everything is emotion-centric. And, and in fact, the transition between the sixth and the seventh sphere in the spirit world, what actually happens is you, in the seventh sphere, you learn to lose your mind. And what I mean by that is that your mind becomes absor absorbed by the soul. So in other words, the soul, the emotions, passions, desires, and all those things, become the driving force of your life and the mind just is a tool that is used to help you do that. That's what actually happens in the transition in the seventh sphere of the spirit world. And you can go through that transition here on earth. And when you go through that transition here on earth, you will feel totally different. You'll, you'll feel like you've lost your mind. And you'll actually start feeling every single... You'll feel every single thing that happens without thinking about it very much. Do you follow, do you follow what I mean? So all New Age philosophy nowadays is saying... Think more positive. But has it helped you? In the long run, maybe a bit, right? Hasn't it? But it hasn't changed lots of these passions and desires and feelings that are inside of your soul, right? And the reason why is because that's the true you. That's the bit that's driving these thoughts. That's why it's so hard to think positive. What you will find when you release the emotion inside of you that drives the lack of positive thought then you will no longer have that thought. Now, can I just say a bit more before I ask any more questions? The, this is a particularly the case with all religious philosophies on earth. You look at all religious philosophies on earth, they all usually have a list of you must not, don't they? You must not commit adultery, you must not murder, you must not steal, you must not, right? All of these you must nots. Why do they create a list of you must nots? Because they are morally true. In other words, they're morally in agreement with God's laws. But why do I need that list? Because inside of myself, I have a feeling I want to commit adultery sometimes, or I have a feeling I want to murder sometimes, or I have a feeling I want to steal sometimes, right? And, it, and so what we do is we create a list of reminders of, no, I'm not allowed to do that. No, I'm not allowed to do that. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Why do I need those reminders? Because the feeling is inside of me. When your heart is transformed, the feeling is no longer inside of you. And so therefore, you will never ever want to do those things again. Right? So for example, let's say I'm a man walking along the street and a good walking good woman walks by and I'm going like, you know. Like, <laughs> and so what's happening is I'm projecting all of this sexual energy at this woman, right? Why am I doing that? Desire. 
Well, let's say I'm already in a relationship. I'm already in a relationship with a woman I'm saying I love. And yet I'm doing, you know. You can still have desire while being in another relationship. How? It's a lack. Well, it's, 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 I mean, as long as you don't. As my mother-in-law keeps on telling me, it doesn't matter where you get your appetite as long as you eat at home. And I totally... <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a common Australian thing, isn't it? <laughs> And from God's perspective, it's totally untrue. In the, in the first century, I said, he who is looking at a woman commits adultery in his heart. Right? Why did I say that? Because it's the heart's desire that is motivating the action. So I'm not condemning the action. What I'm saying is we need to look at the action and say, oh, okay, I have a desire for a woman I've never even met, and yet I'm projecting sexual desires at her. And yet, I'm saying I'm in love with my partner. How can that be happening? There's got to be something emotionally happening inside of me. Does that make sense? Yeah. Something emotionally that when I release it, I will never look at another woman like that again. And I know many of your men feel that that's not ever going to be the case. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I can assure you it will be. So Where, what is that? A lot of it's to do with sexual unworthiness. Yeah. So a lot of it's to do with the fact that I need to be feel a desire, feel a desire, be desired by a beautiful woman before I'm actually valid as a man. So a, a lot of it's to do with that. Right. So uh, it comes from the interrelationship generally between our parents. Usually, uh, many mothers have multi generational abuse issues that have been handed down, child sexual abuse issues that have been handed down generation to generation. So, many mothers, before they're even giving birth to their son, if they have a son, already have an anger towards men sexually. There's a sexual anger towards men. Many fathers also have the viewpoint that they can, uh, they can domineer and dominate their women. Right? And those two emotions in particular are very much linked to sexuality and so they get impressed upon the child even in the womb and so the child has those two emotional damages that they, they need to experience and release before that particular emotion will disappear so so this so if I'm desiring if I'm constantly looking at somebody else other than my partner and not having a, a, a passionate desire for my partner I'm not saying to you you know leave your partner what I'm saying to you, and you can leave with whoever you want if that's what you want to do. What I'm saying to you though is there's an emotion driving that. Look at the emotion. When you take the emotion away, then all of those actions disappear as well. You follow me? Right? Now, how many, like, let's look at the issue of pornography, for example, right? How, there's lots of women in relationships that are very frightened by their men looking at pornography. Right? Okay. And it's a big issue today. What drives a man to look at pornography? So there's got to be an emotion, doesn't it? So what's the emotion? It's just that sexual invalidity. Yeah. good enough. Yeah, that's right. So there's some really deep underlying causal emotions that need to be looked at, if that's the case, if you want the relationship to be happy. Yeah, and and a lot of men get really challenged by that, right? They feel like, no, it's normal. I'm a man, you know. You know, we we sow our seed every we sow our seed everywhere, you know. So, and and it's not true, like. <laughs> well, it is true nowadays, but it's not true. The truth is that God created the soul as a complete unit that split into two. Remember, I said that in that introductory DV. The soul splits into two. In the end. The only relationship you will have sexually is going to be with your soulmate. And you know what? You'll be so passionate about it that nobody else will ever cross your mind or your heart. Right? Now, the only thing that prevents that from occurring is emotional damage. Emotions within us. Emotions with regard to injuries with masculinity or femininity or both. And we need to allow ourselves to feel them. So I'm not saying, you know, there's no harm in the man saying to his wife, look, the truth is that, you know, there were five women today that I looked at when I was walking down the street, you know, and I felt like I'd like to have sex with them. Now, how would, 
How would you feel as a wife if you heard that? Why would you be angry? You'd be denying your own emotion. Do you see what I'm saying? She would be feeling sexually invalid also, right? So she needs to feel those emotions. If you could have an honest dialogue about it, what would happen is you, your wife, if, if the wife was in a state where there was no emotional injury, she could say, well, what's, what emotions driving you that? You know, what do you feel? You know, you could start talking about it at the emotional level. What emotion is driving those desires? What's going on emotionally? But you know what happens most of the time is we judge the person for having that action, do we not? Yeah. And then we want to strangle the person <laughs> for having those actions, right? And, and, and in the end, the emotion, the underlying emotion just gets passed over. Which comes first, the strangulation or the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, most of the time, isn't it, it, we judge when somebody tells us the truth. So let's say your husband or wife came home or your boyfriend or girlfriend came home today and said, and we're going to get drowned out for a little while. Sense. <coughs> I'll let it go fast. I can't compete with a, with a truck that big. <laughs> um, let's say um, they came home and told us that they stole something today. Now, inside of yourself in that moment, there would perhaps be some feelings of judgment, would there not? Mm. Like, how can my boyfriend, girlfriend, partner steal something you know what don't I know about them what are they getting up to <laughs> you know and there's lots of so what's coming up inside of yourself is feelings of mistrust and all those feelings right so if you get angry now about what they've said what are you actually doing now you're now judging them and denying your own emotions right all judgment is a denial of your own emotion uh, the reason why you judge somebody else is because you're denying something going on within yourself. Right? And I've got a whole four-hour discussion about judgment. Um, so, so allow yourself to feel what that feels like. What do you feel like when you know, you've just found out that the partner that you had, who you felt had integrity, is just telling you that he's, he's, he's lied and stolen? How does that feel inside of you? And remember, you attracted it. Because right? he's in your life, you obviously attracted this event to expose an emotion inside of yourself. Right? Did it feel good that they were open and honest enough to share that with you? Yeah, or you could do the opposite like you did with the little child and belt them around a bit and say, naughty guy, you know? And, and uh, which one is it going to be? Now, obviously, the one that responds in love is going to help the person access the emotion. The one that responds in judgment is going to actually deny, shut down, depress the emotion. And you know what we do most of the time? We respond in judgment, don't we? If we're honest. And so what we're doing is we're responding in a way that is denying, expressing and shutting down the other person emotionally. Now that doesn't mean that you need to put up with him lying and stealing every day. If he's not willing to address the emotion, he is going to do it again. Do you understand that? It's the emotion that drives the action. So therefore, if the emotion is still within me, I am going to act again. So let's say I've cheated on my wife, right? And I come home, confess. I confess the whole thing to my wife. My wife gets angry, feels, feels all of her emotions of... What emotions? Rejection. Mistrust, rejection, sexual rejection, shame, guilt. All sorts of things will come up for that woman. that She may have to go through even a month or two, a couple of months of really strong emotions, which all are already existing in her, right? Do you understand that? Yeah. They are all already there, because if they weren't already there, she would have no reaction. She would have no emotional reaction if they weren't already there. So they're already there. So she reacts, and she will need to feel those all emotions. But if he does not feel the emotion of why he cheated, then she would be best to leave him until he feels those emotions. Because you know what's going to happen? He'll do it again. And this is something that you need to bear in mind with all religious forms and all your day-to-day -day actions and everything that's happening inside of you, is that 
if the emotion never leaves you, you will do that again. You will create that again. So you can take whatever pills you want, you can do what, you know, whatever you want externally and physically, but unless you feel the emotion and release the emotion completely, whatever happened in that instant will happen again. Right? To trigger those emotions that you haven't released. If you're experiencing the block and you think it's the, the bottom line, you still can you get to the bottom line by experiencing the block because you don't know it's a block? Even? Well, the, the blocks or need to it? firstly be experienced. Right? So, so like if anger is your first point, so you I need to I need anger. to feel my anger. I, and by the way, I, that doesn't mean I need to yell and scream at everybody in the room. Feeling my anger means I need to acknowledge that I'm angry I can go out and punch and hit and scream and kick and whatever, punch and bag or get out, you know, what some people do is they go out and bash, bash, bash a dead log or something like that until they, until they connect with what's underneath. So the goal is to connect with what's underneath. Once you experience the block, usually what happens under, underneath comes up almost instantly. Right? And usually instantly. Now the block might be guilt. The block might be anger, the block might be shame, the block might be jealousy, the block might be envy, the block, you know, these are all blocking emotions. And we need to feel them and acknowledge them, but not project them. As soon as you project them, you're actually damaging yourself even further. So, if, in other words, if I get angry and then I blame it because you, on you, and I come up and hit you, now I've actually had, a, there's been another sin that I've created in my soul, another error that's been created in my soul, and there's another emotion I'm going to have to experience now. And that is I'm going to have to, through the law of karma, experience every bit of hurt that was created in you from my action of hitting you. In addition to feeling all the emotions that I should have felt as to why I felt like hitting you in the first place. Do you follow that? Yeah. yeah. So the law of compensation works in such a way, and, and we, again we have a four hour discussion on the law of compensation, but it works in such a way that when you do something that is outside of harmony with love, there is an automatic penalty on your soul that needs to be experienced emotionally. And if you did something as a result of denying another emotion, then you're going to have to feel not only the penalty, but also the original emotion anyway before that all gets released. Do you follow? And that makes sense really, isn't it? That's just, if you think about it. If I damage you, because so even my teaching you what I'm teaching you right now, if it's damaging you, I will have to pay a penalty for that. And every, let's say every one of you act upon a certain, the emotion a certain way, and I, and I have taught you something that's wrong, then what's going to have to happen is I'm going to have to experience every single thing that went wrong in your life as a result of the teaching I just taught you. That's pretty powerful when you think about it, isn't it? Yeah. And that's, that's exactly what karma is, the law of compensation. Yeah. So what's he doing? He's projecting onto them blame for every emotion that's inside of himself. Okay, so is that's he, not, it is, I've always just felt like that's just really not helpful because he doesn't move past that, he just stays... Yeah, and I'm not suggesting he moves past it intellectually. What I'm saying is that what he needs to do is he needs to start allowing him... So what he's doing is he's staying in the state of blame. All right? Rather so, than being in the... And when you stay in a state of blame, you do not clear emotion. Right? Because blame is just another projection onto another person. So while everything he's saying may be true, right? and I'm not, I don't know whether it is or isn't, but if it, even if it is true, while he stays in a state of blaming them, he is not taking personal responsibility to release the emotion inside of himself. And if he does that, he is going to stay in that state for years. In fact, there's spirits in the spirit world that have stayed in that state for 10,000 years, in that state of blame. 
right? So you, you can actually stay in that state, and it's not a very good state to stay in, and it's also a first fear, hell, hellish state to stay in for, for a long, long time. What I'm suggesting is to say the truth, but not then to project the blame. So when I'm saying to you, all of you have emotional damage from your parents. All of you have emotional, I have emotional damage, all of you have emotional damage from your parents. Right? I'm not now suggesting that you go home and say and yell and scream at them because you all this emotional damage that they've caused you. What I'm saying is you need to recognise the truth. That emotional damage did come from that place and until you recognise the truth of that, you will not experience it. But that doesn't mean that you now need to blame them for the rest of your life. And I'm saying, if you feel like blaming them, you are actually denying the emotional experience. Isn't that an intellectual understanding, though, to, 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 to say, oh, this is, I understand now that I'm responsible for my own feelings? Yeah, t totally. You need to feel you're responsible for your own feelings, not think it. But isn't that also like a level of maturity of the, the mind, which is a part of our spiritual body, not part of our soul? Um, it, it rea in reality, comes from uh, a, a soul feeling. So, so you, how many of you believe that you're responsible for your emotions? Right. Okay. Well, I can tell you that the majority of you are liars right at this moment. <laughs> we're responsible for what we do with our emotions. No, like, no. Let, let, me, let, me, let me go back. Why, why, why have I accused you of being a liar? The reason why is because right at this moment you are denying huge amounts of emotions within you. Now, if you felt, if you felt in your soul 100% responsible for all your emotions, you would already be not in a state of denial of those emotions. Does that make sense yeah. to you? Right? So the truth is actually that the majority of you feel that you're not responsible for your emotions and that somebody else is. And that's one of the blocks. You feel that in your heart. You feel like how and let's be honest, how many of you do how many of you have been abused as children? Like, yeah? Okay. Those of you who have been abused as children, how many of you be and be honest, how you really do feel blame, don't you? Like anger, upset, blame about, you know, they did those things to me, I didn't deserve it, all those emotions? Yeah? That's real. Right? That's true. You will feel those emotions. The key now is to go deeper and say, all right, they created these emotions, but now they are inside of me. And who's the only person that has control of what's inside of me? Is me. And, that, and I need to feel that at some point. And the reason why many people who go to therapy for 10, 15, 20 years because of sexual abuse never get over their sexual abuse is because they do not do that. They do not take that personal responsibility for the emotion. I'm not saying for the events. I'm saying the emotion is now inside of you. If you don't let yourself open up that emotion, it cannot flow out of you. And that is not an intellectual state. That is an emotional state. It will certainly help you intellectually having the realisation. But emotionally you need to have that realisation before the emotion will flow. So it, it, I've written some stuff... Um, uh, what did I call it? I think it was about divine repentance and forgiveness or whatever. And in there I talk about a process of um, intellectual realisation compared to emotional realisation. And intellectual realisation certainly does help you get to emotions if you have the choice to do the emotional work. But intellectual realisation can also help you get far away from your emotion by denying it. It all depends on what your attention is. So I could say... I could say, my parents are now, like, I am responsible for emotion. I can say those words, but they mean nothing unless I feel them. Do, that makes sense, doesn't it? If I feel them, then I will take in that instant total responsibility. So how many of us are taking total responsibility for every emotion inside of ourselves right at this moment? <laughs> If I was, I'd probably already be at one with God, right? So, so if I had a longing for divine love in that process, I would already be at one with God if I was doing that. The truth is, if I'm not, then I can't be. Face the truth. I'm not taking full emotional responsibility. And it's okay, it's not a judgement. It's just a 
truth. It's just a reality. Don't be afraid of truth. If you're afraid of truth, you'll never get anywhere. <laughs> Uh, allow the truth. The truth is, I am not taking full responsibility right now. I can talk about it all I like, but if I'm not feeling the emotion right now. So I said, before I began this today, I said, I'm blocked here and I'm blocked here. Did I not? Mm -hmm. uh, why? Because I am not taking full responsibility for this particular emotion. And uh, it's going to come up. I can feel it coming up. So, and over the next few days, I'm going to take full responsibility. And at that instant, I will feel it. That awareness coming to it. If you're out, say, driving your car and someone cuts off and you're an idiot, you say, well, hey, where did that come from? You have a smile, but you're aware of how your feelings at that time. Yep. So when you become aware of your emotions, is that dealing with it or just, just sensing it? Same? Yeah, th this is where the mind is really good. The mind can allow you to become aware if you uh, switch on in that regard. So use your mind as a tool to become aware. And um, So yes, take away, like in that instance, I got cut off. All right, I got cut off and I yelled at them. But hang on a sec, hang on a sec. I created this pe person cutting me off. Yeah. The law of attraction, right? I attracted this event into my life to access this emotion. What's the emotion? I feel angry with this man. What do I want to do with the person who cut me off? Becoming aware, deeper. that was a habit I've been into. Every yep. time I come up, that happens now, I'm aware of, I can smile straight because, hey, that's a habit. Ah. Yeah, but, if, you know. yeah, but what you're doing is you're skipping it. Here's, you're not feeling this. You follow me? What you're doing is you're skipping now. You've become aware and you're saying to yourself, oh, now that I'm aware, the truth is that you'll never be cut off again once you deal with the emotion. So I just, every time I get cut off, call him an idiot? No, no. <laughs> calling, calling him an idiot is a projection of anger. That causes even more soul damage to yourself. Right, so you need to you need to you need to just stop for a moment and say, I'm really angry with that person, but it's got nothing to do with that person. I attracted this event to access a deeper emotion. What am I feeling? What's my feeling? And sometimes your feeling might be my life was threatened, or you know, what what does it feel like if my you know oh, I'm not valued. I'm under you know nobody valued. Nobody cares about me. He didn't care about me, you know, and go into that emotion and, and let yourself experience it. You can use your mind certainly to do that. To access those emotions, right? <laughs> but if you keep skipping over it and saying, "Oh, yeah, I'm aware of that now," and skip over the the actual emotion processing, tomorrow another person's going to cut you off, and another person, <laughs> and you're going to have a year of you know that happening and accidents and all sorts of things. I know one lady had 17 accidents in one year doing that, telling herself things, and then you know having another accident. Most of them not her fault, she said, but the law of attraction was at work, right? So. So they were triggering something in her soul that she was denying. Yeah. So go deeper than that. Excuse me, you were saying that we need to know the cause as well as feel the feeling. And you're talking about the first century. Well, feeling the feelings is always the cause, right? Feeling, feeling the feelings. Yeah, but, but I, was, I was thinking about the cause then. How would we know if they're in past lifetimes? We don't have that memory to help us. Like you could, could say now, Lord, <laughs> Yep. Um, and you can do that, like if you were ill-treated then, by, say by your parents, then you cannot do that to your children and give them a better life. Well, let, be let, well, let me say categorically, firstly, something that's going to trigger many of you emotionally. <laughs> None of you have had past lifetimes. Except you. Yeah. So how can you explain, can you explain cellular memory that people have, that things right. may have happened to them in the past? Let's, let's look at it. And let's look at what's really happening. Here's you. Here's your physical body, your spirit body, and your half of the soul, right? So let's say I'm a male, so that's a masculine half of the soul. Here's people in the spirit world with their soul connected to their spirit body, right? You understand so far? Every single person in the spirit world is attracted to you based on your emotional feelings. So you know how all of you have been attracted here today. So there is all something, there is something common with all of you right at this moment, isn't there? A desire for truth is one of those things, right? 
or a, or a desire to listen to a crazy man. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever it is, it's common, right? Now, now all, all attractions in the entire universe operate in the same way, in that they operate on your emotional condition. They operate on your soul condition. So what, what I call the soul condition is what every single law of attraction operates on, including attractions with spirits. Now what happens is a spirit can attach themselves to you. And in fact, this happens all the time. In fact, every single one of you has a spirit attached to you. Right at this moment. Right. Now, I want to listen to you too. There, there's quite a few tens of thousands of spirits here with us today and and some of them came along because you came along some of them came along one of them one of them came along because they were your guide so that they are permanently attached to you right? your guide is permanently attached to you when I say attached your guide is there and actually given to you by God to actually look after you and guide you on your spiritual journey all of you also have a guardian, and a guardian looks after your physical body as best they can. They, in other words, they keep you alive as best they can, given your free will. Right. And then you also have all these spirits around you who like you, <laughs> and they feel attracted to you because of this emotion in you or that emotion in you. So let's say, let's say I've been abused as a child, and, and I'm a male, and I've been abused as a child. There will be male spirits in the spirit world who are with me. Who have been abused as children? Are they healed or are they still carrying their own abuse? A lot of times they'll be carrying their own abuse still. So they might be just reinforcing your problem, right? They will be. Supporting they, they will, well, everything is the law of attraction. So if we look at it that way, it's all supporting me to deal with it. Yeah. But so it yes, could be, could be making it it'll make it more intense, yeah. certainly. And all of you are being impressed in this way. All of you are being impressed on a day to day, hour by hour, minute by minute basis. Now, Every one of these spirits who is attracted to you has a life. They had a life when they're on earth, and they have a life now in the spirit world. And they have memories, and they have pictures in their mind, and they have thoughts, and they have feelings. And every one of those things, depending on how open you are, can be connected to you. So I, if I'm a spirit, I can give you a thought, I can give you a feeling, I can give you a picture of my life, I can do all of that. You follow me? And and what often happens is there are emotions in this soul of mine that are familiar emotions, if you like, or sympathetic emotions to the emotions that are in the soul of this spirit. Do you follow me? That's what causes the attraction. It's the soul-to-soul -soul attraction. That it's the emotions that cause the attraction. Now, with the emotions in there, so let's say my emotion is I am angry with men and I'm a woman. Let's say that's my emotion. I'm going to attract women in the spirit world who are yet to deal with their emotions who are also angry with men. And whenever something happens to me in my life where a man makes me get angry, I might even feel a sense of rage towards that man, almost uncontrollable. Right? And that will be often the sympathetic attraction between the spirit and yourself making the emotion even stronger in you so that you become aware of it and deal with it. You follow me? But they also affect my physical body. Remember, it's the emotions that affect my physical body. So if this person's atta attached to me in some way, then my body is going to get damaged because of it. And that's what they call so-called cellular memory. In reality, the instant you pass, there's no cellular memory in your physical form. So therefore... Sorry? Wouldn't the memory be in the soul? Yeah, but I wouldn't call it cellular. Yeah. Ancestral yeah. cellular memory, though. Um, well, that is all soul damage. So everything is emotions in the soul, in reality. I don't, like, why, it doesn't matter what you call it, whether you want, if you want to call it cellular memory, we'll call it that. But that tends to imply that it's physical, that it's in your body and it's not. Because the moment you pass, you won't have this body, but you'll still have the memory and you'll still have the emotion. So therefore, it can't be in the body, right? You have emotional damage from ancestors that are in your soul, and that causes damage in your two bodies. So let's say, let's say. Um, so, so the body doesn't pass on memory genetically. No. Or, or no, the genetics are the result of the soul condition. 
the, bo bo the, the soul passes on the genetics. You follow me? So, so for example, let's say my grandfather had diabetes and my father was born, he is going to have very, very similar emotions in him that the grandfather has if the grandfather did not clear his emotions. And he will get diabetes, guaranteed. Right? And then if he doesn't clear those emotions and work on those emotions, then his son will get diabetes. Right? And everyone will say, oh, it's genetic. Mm -hmm. And yes, I suppose you could say it's sort of genetic. It's genetic at the soul level, the emotional level. Now, let me just carry this on a little further because um, I just want to relate a few spirit experiences that I've had about this to, to illustrate it. And when I was in Greece last, uh, which was about, I don't know, eight, 16 weeks ago or something like that, there was a lady who was a healer. And what she did was she would go, she's quite a very mediumistic uh, lady as well, so she'd speak with spirits and heal people. And... Her husband, 17 years ago, was dying of diabetes. And his father had died of diabetes, and his grandfather had died of diabetes. Right? And, um, and what happened was she, she healed him. She, she, she has a spirit with her who helps her do her healing, and the spirit with her healed, healed her husband. And I won't say much about how it happened yet, because that, that comes clearer later. What happened was that the instant her husband was healed, the lady herself contracted diabetes. And now she, 17 years later, was dying from diabetes. So when I met her just recently, she was dying of diabetes. There was no amount of insulin she could take anymore that would help her, and she was going to die. All right? So that's what happened to this lady. Now, what was going on? What was going on was there was a spirit who had passed over nearly 300 years ago who had attached to the emotions of each subsequent generation of men in their family. And he had killed them with his attachment. Right? The attachment was one based on certain emotions inside of the soul, in the pancreas region. And, and what happened was that that attachment slowly it caused this physical damage in the, in, in the pancreas, which actually then created the illness, which then created the disease, which then caused the death of every generation in, in their life. Every, you know, the grandfather, the father and, and the son. Now, what we did is we started talking to the spirit, this spirit who was attached to this lady. The reason why the spirit attached to the lady because he got angry with her for kicking him out of her husband. <coughs> right? So he felt angry with her for kicking him out of where he was, you know, he was actually residing. And what we had to do is convince this spirit actually to step away from her body for a while and actually look at the damage that he was doing to the body. And he didn't even realise the damage he was doing to the body. Once he started realising that, he actually stepped out of the body for a while and he also saw himself, which was a bit of a shock because he looked quite ugly. And naturally so, because he'd killed quite a number of the generation of, of people because of his actions without realising. But what happened was he then started looking at himself and he started looking at what the damage was in her body and he, and he stayed out of her body after that. Right? He stayed out of the connection. Now, I'll illustrate another one, and that is that almost every person who drinks to oblivion and still walks home has a spirit walking home for them. You follow me? See, what happens is when a lot of people pass, you know, alcohol is pretty prominent here on earth now, right? When a lot of people pass, what happens is that they still want to drink. Why do they want to drink? Because they want to get away from the terrible emotions they've been avoiding all their life while they were drinking, right? So they still want the drink, but the drink's not available in the spirit world. So what they do is they physically attach to a drinker on earth and cause him to drink as much as he poss they possibly can so they can share in some of the emotion. You follow me? So they can share, they think themselves to be drunk through the experience. They can feel the feeling of drunkenness. And it detunes them from their emotion. And yet, they can st keep a person upright who's not any, in any way conscious of what they're doing. How many of you have been drunk to the point where you're totally unconscious of what you've been doing? Quite a few? At that moment, you had a spirit driving you. Right? And they were driving you to get that emotion to get that feeling, to get that feeling happening. 
Now, what's actually happening is a sympathetic attraction. They are attracted to you because of right, an emotion inside of yourself. And they, they want the drink, and they know you will drink enough for them to share in the experience. Huh? Um, I know it's all to do with attraction, but in the case where that lady um, and, and that spirit was attached to each of those colours, yep. were their spirit guides just going... Like letting it happen, or would they go, hey, um, No, the spirit guides were always the spirit guides will always be trying to show the person that something's going on, but unfortunately, what happens most of the time is people don't respond to what the spirit guides are trying to show them. Every single day of your life, spirit guide, your spirit guide is trying to lead you down a path that they know you want in the end, so they can read your soul and they know what you want. And they're trying to lead you down that path, to help you down that path. But often you resist it because of your emotions. Right? So you have an emotion of fear, or you have an emotion of mistrust, or you have an emotion of you know, one of those other emotions. And so what happens is you know, they can't lead you the best they possibly could. And this happens even when you pass. This person here who's influencing this person also has a guide trying to help them not do that anymore. Right? But again, they're often not listening. Right? So there's this constant stream of information coming from God through, uh, through spirits of different levels of love to try and influence the breakage of these particular relationships. But because they are codependent relationships, they stay in a series of codependency until they have a realisation. Would there would have been anything that those fellows could have done to re release the spirit? Yes, the they needed to release the emotion that caused the attraction. <coughs> Yep. To her, yep. There would have been some sympathetic attraction between her and that spirit. Exactly. So she wasn't a victim of killing him. She just pulled him in because she wasn't clear herself. That's right. There was a there was a sympathetic attraction, but also there was the attraction of anger with men, which caused a corresponding anger return from the spirit as well. So, so yes, she had two emotions: the original emotion that would have caused diabetes, but also this attraction because of the mutual anger for of each other. If that makes sense. And that caused the attraction. So, yes, the only, the only way to permanently dis disable any connection with a spirit is to release the emotion. So, no matter how, how, how dark a spirit is, 